Hello and welcome to this uh, new season of Candid Convo. Uh, my name is Steve Dunkley. I hope you're well and staying safe as COVID-19 continues to frustrate and keep everyone in lockdown. So for this episode, we're going to be delving into the world of business risk and insurance, uh, specifically the type that's covered in the Lloyds market in London. And uh, for those not familiar with Lloyds, this is an insurance market famous for its giant underwriting room that pre-COVID would be buzzing with managing agents, underwriting syndicates and insurance brokers from a whole host of companies procuring cover for a myriad of risks, including some of the unusual and the speciality risks. So I'm pleased to welcome my panellists today, Lou Smith, the Chief Digital Officer of Lloyd's, Rachel Turk, who represents the insurance underwriter Beasley, that has a number of syndicates that occupy a, a number of booths within the uh, Lloyd's underwriting room under the Beasley Furlong name. And also welcome Julia Graham, the Deputy CEO and Technical Director of AMIC, which is the Risk Management Association that represents the uh, companies that will be buying the insurance and risk products, the policyholders, as it were. So today we're going to explore the new risk landscape for enterprises in this COVID world. We're going to be exploring how the Lloyd's market is transforming itself. And also we look at the future of insurance, especially when we're surrounded by emerging technology and a sort of ecosystem of stakeholders. So before we get stuck into the conversation, it will be good to get acquainted with everybody. Now, first of all, Lou, you've been with Lloyd's for uh, about a year or so as Chief Digital Officer. Tell us about the journey so far and how that compares with what you're doing in the banking space. Thanks, Steve. So, hi, I'm Lou Smith. As Steve said, I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Lloyds of London. And what a year that's been, eh? I walked through the door, would you believe, about a year ago, last Monday, and I had the privilege of spending a few weeks in the office. I'm new to insurance. I've always worked in the retail bank, a lot in startup land as well as digital transformation. So, it's been quite an interesting year to learn a new industry as part of financial services and pivot a business model is probably the best way to say it, which we're working hard to do. But I think the opportunity we have and how Lloyd's is uniquely positioned to support its customers, its market participants in solving for some of the biggest things that we face, including pandemics, but cybercrime, climate, etc., is a real interesting time. In my year, I managed to work in the office a few weeks, so I got the privilege of walking through the underwriting room on my first day in green corduroy, which was an experience in itself. I think, secondly, to then work with the market about how do we start to first operate remotely, then start to operate effectively remotely, and then start to look at how do we use data and digital to work effectively and efficiently across the market not creating digital twins. We're not here to replicate things. As you know, Steve, I'm a fan of how do you take great interactions, data and digital, and create something far more powerful. So I've been working since we went into lockdown on those big end-to-end experiences. What can we do quickly to support? How could we help people to connect, collaborate, and meet? And we launched the virtual room, which is just about to go into version two, um, which is a massive upgrade on what we did in September, responding to market feedback. We've launched research, user testing, user driven design all in the open. And I was part of the team working on the strategy in Blueprint 2, which I know you're going to talk about. Um, And then as we come into 2021, it's very much a how do we deliver all of those components, which is largely data transformation and then connecting all the components that we need to. And then as we go into the back end of the year, into 22, how do we really help the market drive the adoption of that? Um, There's a lot that we need to do. So it's probably been one of the most eventful years of my career and life. And I love it. So and what a great place it is to be. Excellent. Sounds like a whirlwind. It is. (laughs) Good stuff. So now, um, Rachel, tell us about Beasley's relationship with Lloyd's and sort of the risks you're covering and what you're doing in your, in your own role at the moment. Uh, OK, so if I if I start with that first, I'm the head of corporate development at Beasley, and I've been doing that role for about 18 months. And that encompasses M&A, strategy, sustainability, ESG, an incubation underwriting team. The other half of my role is really, I'd call it chief of staff to the CEO. So that's been fascinating. And again, you know, similar to Lou, you know, what an 18 months for me it's been. And when I took on the role, I didn't really expect that we'd be managing through a pandemic, but I obviously had a ringside seat to all of that. So it's been it's been a real privilege, I think, to be at the table and the decision making table for everything that we went through as an organization. 
Prior to that, I was uh, an underwriter for 10 years at Beasley again, um, so worked in the Lloyds market. And then, you know, you asked, what is our current presence in Lloyds? I mean, we are one of the largest single syndicates at Lloyds. Um, We have a number of different syndicates, but we operate predominantly through our main syndicate, which is 623 2623. And it was, you know, in the region of over $2 billion gross premium income last year. So it's a significant size and we're a specialist insurer. So we write, you know, marine property, some reinsurance. My lines of business were the casualty, the liability classes, which is where my background came from. We're a big writer of cyber. And so we're in some of those, I guess, more bespoke classes than non-commoditized classes. And they are risky, but that's what we do as a market. That's Louise's raison d'etre to me, is being able to understand and take risk. And you mentioned in your introduction, it's all the things about the new, the novel, the, the not seen before. And that's the stuff that Beasley really enjoys and really likes getting to grips with. It's excellent. Good stuff. And uh, Julia, it's great to have you on a previous episode of Candid Convo uh, when you're talking about sort of supply chain risk and sort of light of Brexit and COVID. Um, tell us about what you've been up to recently and how you're collaborating with both Lloyds and Beasley. Hi, Steve. And uh, it's great to meet Rachel and Lou and to join you today. And thanks very much for uh, inviting Emic in because quite often we're not necessarily invited to the table to give the customer's voice. So it's great to be able to do that today. I have to say Lloyd's is the exception to that point. And that's not just because Rachel and Lou are on this call, but I think Lloyd's have a great reputation for putting the customer first. And with a lot of the work that they've been doing in the last few years on the whole subject of innovative developments at Lloyd's and underwriting, they have always been very keen to consult our members and to ask them what they think. So big tick and a big thank you from me on behalf of our AirMIC members in that regard. One of the things we've been working on really closely in the past few months is trying to support Lloyd's on work that they're doing in a project called Future Minds. In addition to the transformation of Lloyd's, which Lou referred to when she spoke, there's also a project called Future Minds, which is looking at the rising tide of intangible assets and what Lloyds can do to use their innovative powers to support the insurance of issues like reputation. Rachel's already mentioned cyber, but looking at, again, at how we can be more innovative in supporting insurance solutions, all in the context of two big things that are going on in our lives. The first, which sort of dropped off the radar a little bit, but is back on the radar to an extent, is Brexit. And for financial services, Brexit is still, to some extent, unfinished business. And the other big one is in uh, the wider context of the pandemic and what many of our members are seeing in terms of some of the stresses and strains on their business. So Lloyd's is the centre, I think, of innovation in the insurance industry in many regards. And so we've been watching very closely what Lloyd's have been doing to repurpose themselves And we've been watching very closely what individual organisations like Beasley, who are part of Lloyd's, are doing individually to rise to some of the opportunities that we think are out there. So we're all running faster, including at AMIC and including our members. And we're all chasing to make sure that that time lag doesn't open up between the opportunities that innovation presents and the way that we can capture and convert them into being a leaner and fitter business. So it's exciting times, challenging times, but also incredibly exciting times because this is when innovation hits the high road. Uh, We all know that there's a seismic change going on in the way that we live and work. And um, we're gonna rise to that challenge and we're gonna rise to that challenge with our friends at Lloyd's. Wow, so seismic and airmic sort of change. <laughs> and uh, yeah. yes, <laughs> I, I can't think of any other way to describe it, Steve, because that's just what it is. I've never exactly. seen in my career anything quite like it. Um, yeah. So it's scary and exciting all at the same time. Mm, exactly. But yeah, I mean, obviously with Lou, the future at Lloyd's, it's a big, big program. Blueprint One was launched at the back end of 2019 with a focus on modernizing the management of complex risk capital claims and bringing out innovations like risk exchange syndicate in a box and new services hub and then blueprint two came out three months ago so how's that transition from blueprint one to blueprint two going yeah great question steve 
Blueprint 2 is the practical application of Blueprint 1 in terms of an operating model. So the ambition of Blueprint 1 has not been lost. We're still driving towards that world's most advanced insurance digital marketplace. And what Blueprint 2 set out, which we launched on the 5th of November, is really about what are the steps that we're going to take over the next two years to execute against that. And very much data at the core, which I think Julia talked about and also Rachel, actually. So if you look at it, it's how do we create that core record that flows through the placement of risk and also the recovering from loss when you get through claims? And how do we do that in an efficient, transparent, immediate way? And we're designing, as as Julia talked about, with the customer or the market participant at the heart of that. So the virtual room was designed by the market. Um, We launched it in six weeks. So we're also working in a different way with Blueprint 2. And we did that learning last year. Um, So we're working obviously fully remote, the same as everybody else. But that kind of research, test, iterate, scale is how we're operating so that we get things out in the hands of the market quickly. We can then iterate and test again. So something like the virtual room that was really focused on how did we help people connect in remote land. In fact, we even launched interactive guides about how you use all the tools and things you've got on your laptop because we had all this stuff, but I don't think everybody knew what it could do to help us work effectively. And we did that within about two to three weeks of pivoting to remote working. We've then started to sign up um, the market participants into the virtual room. The next versions are integration into your calendars, So that back-end integration is massive value and it gives you the opportunity to flex that time. So one of the biggest things we've learned in the market is in remote land, everything's a 30-minute conversation, even though it might be 30 seconds or 45 minutes. And that whole availability piece, which you could do really easy in the room, was quite tricky to do first off in remote land. We've researched that and tested it and what goes live at the end of this month will actually have a massive impact to help the market including the rollout to all classes of business which we've actually accelerated in fact i was on a podcast recently and somebody said monzo would have been really happy with that product delivery so i am going to take that no question i'm going to take that because everybody thinks we're slow we're not so um so we, we've learned a lot, not just what we need to focus on over the next two years with Blueprint 2, but also how do we deliver that at pace so you see those constant improvements rather than big drops of stuff. So you will see that as we go through. On top of that, and again, Rachel and Julia have talked about it, you know, you've got to carve out, I mean, Steve, you and I know each other from Retail Bantland. Um, I was in retail banking 10 years ago um, when we came through the financial crisis and saw the rise of the retail challengers. And their business model was the customer right at the centre of it. And you felt it. It was lived, not spoken. And I also sat around tables where it was like, yeah, but they'll never get a licence. They'll never get customers and they'll never make money. And they did. And everything I'm seeing in this is the rise of disruption innovation within insurance and asset management um, we launched future set which is actually looking at how do we get across some of those risks that are emerging out of the pandemic we've also supported the distribution of the vaccine through companies like parcel that came out of the the labs and we're looking at how do we lean into the startup community or into the technical community to help accelerate our strategy. So whilst we're really focused on getting that data right, building out those end-to-end journeys for open market, delegated, and looking at what's that end-to-end transparent, fully automated type of processing so that things can go through without friction and effortless, so that the brokers, the underwriters, the managing agents can focus on great interactions, which is fundamental and critical. We're also looking at, to, to both Rachel's and Julia's point, what are also those things that we're going to see emerge out of this so that we can keep an eye on? Is there opportunity to look at some of those big innovations? But Blueprint 2 is the practical application of Blueprint 1 over the next two years. 
and it's a real exciting time. But it's not just what we do, it's also how we work that we're changing. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how you're working with the uh, virtual room. And I was going to ask uh, Rachel how your underwriters have adapted to the virtual room and what Julia and uh, Lou were talking about, how your underwriters are driving that innovation as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the transition to remote working, it was always challenging because it was you're taking what was a very historic way of trading face to face you know and and still despite the advent of you know ppl which i think this has been a really good system when i was using it you know people still brought around physical paper slips and you know we do still have a lot of inefficiency built into the system because even when it was electronic it was all done on pdf so there was no straight through processing is coming but we're still struggling with that element when we switched to working virtually you know, not all markets are created equally. So some lines of business, it doesn't make a great deal of difference. So in the line of business I was in at d even before the pandemic, most of my interactions were over the phone. I would go to Lloyd's maybe once or twice a week, but the brokers, most of the time, they wouldn't come to trade. They'd, we'd come for a chat, really. And it was, we'd call it intelligence gathering. Other people may call it market gossip, but you know, whichever, whichever way you look at it, but that is valuable to be fair. You take markets like the marine market, they're very much used to face-to-face interaction. And they've struggled a little bit more with adopting the virtual. Now, you know, all the technologies in place for it to happen. You know, the comments that you get from some of the underwriters is it's a bit slower. One of the benefits of Lloyd's has been that ability to quickly face to face figure out the issue. You know, what are we talking about? What is it? It's a wording that needs tweaking. What may it be? Could we do it like this? Could we do it like this? So there's maybe a little bit that's been lacking, just the speed of doing business. And, you know, for a broker perspective, we're looking at it from an underwriter. We might have one line on a stamp. For a broker, well, you know, they might go, okay, well, I've now managed to get Beasley signed up. I now need to go and speak to the next and the next and the next. And, you know, the way the physical room was organized is that you typically have most of the marine underwriters sitting in one place. So as a broker, you can go around and go, right, I've got my lead market. And now I've lined up all my follow markets behind the slip so there's a little bit of inefficiencies but I think to be perfectly honest I think that's teething pain of getting used to a different way of working not that the old way is the right way I think it's just it's a transition we've all had to get our heads around doing things differently and I love Lou's point that every meeting is 30 minutes whether it's a 30 second interaction or 45 minutes it doesn't make any difference we schedule everything in 30 minute increments right so that does take a bit of getting used to Your other question on innovation, and it's so nice to be here with Julia and actually have the voice of the client, because the insurance industry has had a habit in the past of designing these really great products, really technical, really cool, and then finding that people didn't really want to buy them because we hadn't actually asked whether the client wanted them. They made sense from a technical perspective. They were kind of cool, but they weren't necessarily what people wanted. From an innovation perspective, we would view our culture as innovation is at the core of everything that we do. Every team is pushed every year to what could you do? What could you do more for your clients? What could you add on to your product? What could you do a bit differently? And then uh, about a year ago, I wanted to set up an incubation underwriting team, which sits outside of the trading team structure and, and reports into me. And the aim for that one was how do we do groundbreaking innovation? How do we take a new product that doesn't fit within a trading team and that you don't then get rebuffed because, you know, every underwriter's there going, and, I, you know, I've been there, I'm really busy, I've got all of my renewals coming up, I've got all of my clients I'm meeting, I don't have time to innovate, think about, give this this one the, this is the intellectual capital it requires to determine what the solution is. So, but why don't we just carve that out and give it to a couple of people and go, right, that's your job. And a lot of it is around the intangible space right now. That makes sense. We're looking at it going the intangibles, massive part of balance sheets, very underinsured. We've just relaunched a reputational risk product. And a lot of the conversations are, you know, with the client, what's the demand? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? And how can we solve it? How can insurance be used here? And I think when we talk about innovation as well, to me, innovation isn't just here's an insurance product and it's a risk transfer because there's so much more we can do as an industry. We can do all of the, the risk management services. You know, we have ultimately as an insurance company and the industry, a lot of aggregated knowledge that we can use to help a client better. So if you look at the cyber products, you know, when you look at the, the, the cyber breaches, you know, client, most of them would hopefully not experience one, but if they do, it will hopefully be the only breach that they experience. Well, we have the experience of handling hundreds, probably thousands of data breaches for our clients. So we can use that to help any client and have them go, well, this is what you do. These, the, here's the solution in place um, and they can seamlessly provide that risk management solution. So to me, that's where innovation should go. You know, the core message is that it has to be client driven. Otherwise, it's pointless. So it needs to be from the client demand. 
and it needs to be more than just risk transfer. There's so much more value that we can have in the chain. I'm very excited by what Beasley are doing, including your uh, new development on reputation, which in fact Beasley have shared with us. So we, we know a little bit about that. So I think that's the epitome of, of what Rachel has been saying. I think the other one is that uh, we're also taking part in a, a project called Future Minds, which was developed at the tail end of 2019 and is all about innovative product development to just support the client-driven nature of that as well. Airmec members have been invited to take part in that project. And we had about a dozen Airmec members who were in the first run of it and working with organisations that have been introduced uh, to the client by Lloyd's. And the organisations get the chance to pitch the products that they're developing and hopefully they will go on to be um, successful, innovative solutions, which either support some more uh, traditional solutions or maybe take off in their own right. And we've been uh, interested to watch one or two of those ideas since the inception of Future Minds. Uh, and uh, some of those products have actually now come to market uh, and are trading either with insurer partners or in their own right. Um, the other initiative, which I think is worthy of mention, is the Lloyd's Product Innovation Facility, elegantly sometimes called PIF, um, as in Product Innovation and Facility. That was a new facility launched um, at Lloyd's, and it was specifically to provide meaningful capacity for emerging and developing exposures that don't really fit some of the traditional or legacy risk profiles that I was talking about before. And they can be insured um, by the less traditional classes uh, and approaches to business. And I think um, the product innovation facility is very interesting because it, it, it is actually exactly what Rachel was describing and, and Lou was also alluding to, which is that Lloyd's has got a reputation for innovation. It's long been their trademark. And I think the Future Minds project and the uh, product innovation facility are two very intangible examples of Lloyd's actually delivering what they're talking about rather than just talking about them. So uh, we are involved in and support both of those initiatives, uh, Steve, and um, I think they're fantastic examples of what my two Lloyd's colleagues have been saying. Excellent. And Lou, do you have much involvement in the PIF, as it were? We love an acronym, don't we? <laughs> it's a good <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah, piss. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and it never fits well with my Wolverhampton accent either at all, does it? So, um, um, yeah, I do. I've actually worked around a number of labs. And I think what Julia is talking about is what's really good about that model. It is focused outward, i.e. how do you actually create the space for that thinking, but then also launch quite quickly if there's something that you want to then focus on. Some of the feedback I get from the startup community or the innovators or disruptors, because not all of them are startups, as we know, Lloyd's is really good and so is the market at giving a yes or no rather than a long, slow maybe, because that doesn't help anybody. And that was one of the issues we used to have in the retail banks is people used to be bounced around a lot. Um, where they could see an opportunity to help accelerate. So the Product Innovation Lab, also the Innovation Lab, so the cohorts, the mentoring, all of that type of stuff. I'm also keen to look to those labs to actually, how can we help accelerate some of the components in the blueprint um, to create that modern, flexible, efficient digital architecture that enables us to assemble, to swap things in and out very quickly so it lives and adapts rather than it's actually a big monolithic technical thing. So we're using all of those modern techniques um, to how we can actually move forward quickly on the blueprint. In fact, I'd like to, one of the things that we're, we're looking at, which we talked about previously, um, was creating some sort of a type sandbox so that people can plug stuff in rather than us talking about it and see how does it work so that we can start to see things quickly and where they can add value the underwriting room and the work that we're doing there which we're focused on getting some designs out to the market and the market participants really quickly and because julia talked about this there's elements of the underwriting room there's some rituals or there's some things in there that you really wouldn't want to lose as we move forward and what i'm very conscious of and i'm working with some of my colleagues is 
it isn't about replacing those things with a digital or fully virtual thing. It's how do we take the best of that physical space, the best of digital, the best of data, and create something far more powerful, but put some of those uh, points that Julia spoke about, the labs, the ecosystem, the innovation, into the heart of that as well, so people can interact with them. Now, we're, we're working through that as we speak. In fact, I'm sure that Rachel and, and Rachel's team will be involved in even sharing their views because uh, we're doing the research at the moment, and I see Rachel's nodding, which is good. We're asking the market what they want as well and how far do we push that. And I think that's probably once in a generation opportunity to create something that is is really powerful. So if we can take all of that repair or process or friction out of the journeys, then those physical interactions become even more powerful. And that's where I think we have such an opportunity now. Um, and it's an horrific intervention, COVID is, uh, and nobody would want it. But I think it's put conversations on the table that may have been off the table and I think that piece there, that future role of the underwriting room, bringing all the stuff we're doing on virtual room, all the stuff that Julia and Rachel have talked about together into a new business model is the real opportunity that we have. Mm. And, and that will be with the market, how we design that moving forward. But hopefully we won't call it an acronym. Piff. <laughs> so I'll ask you actually, Louise, because um, you've got these cohorts that take place every so often. Yeah, um, mentoring and ones, yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and all these sort of small uh, startups and, well, there's a couple of mature players as well, like Experian, I understand. There are, yep. You mentioned a little bit of that you're, you're, you're watching what's going on and potentially having the, these guys help collaborate. What's your vendor landscape at the moment? Do you have many service providers or vendors that you work with, whether they're big or small, in, in the blueprint too? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Steve, I work, I'm also appointed by the Treasury, actually, as one of their fintech envoys. So I'm really passionate about that community because... It's not one to be fearful of. Actually, for me, what it's driving is greater collaboration. Um, and I think if you see it that way and look at how do you take the best of these established brands as well as the disruptors coming through, we've got some of the design agencies. who were at the start of when digital wasn't even a thing, working with us on our end-to-end -end experiences and some of the research there. And the power and value of some of the stuff that's coming out of that. I saw a video of market participants giving feedback on interaction layers and the difference. I mean, nothing's more powerful than people that use it when they're actually telling you this makes a difference. And if I can get those voices around the underwriting room, can you imagine the power that would create as well mm. on some really simple things? This isn't difficult. So, um, yeah, we've got a big vendor landscape, but also the way we've designed the immersive web experience for Blueprint 2, so we've got a PDF, but we've also got an immersive web. So you go onto it, Future at Lloyd's. And actually, you can click on each part of the journey if you are a vendor or you're in the ecosystem, or if you're a market participant and go, I can help here. And we can collect that feedback real time. And we've got a whole team of people who will get back to you to look at, you know, what could we do? Can we work together? Is there an opportunity? So we're encouraging that. What we need, though, is if people are reaching out, is you know your organisation or your business model better than tell us how you can help us, be as specific as you can, because then that helps us navigate that quickly. Uh, but you would expect me to do that reach out because it's something that I'm, I think there's an opportunity to accelerate some of this stuff if we get it right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's all about the ecosystems that were, and it I think... Is. Yeah, I mean, with Rachel, an ecosystem is quite important for you because there's quite a few moving parts in terms of the players involved in, in transactions and deals and so forth. So tell us about how ecosystem development is important and how you're driving that. It's, it's interesting when we talk about ecosystem development because people go straight to, well, this is a new thing. And it's like, oh, well, is it blockchain? This ecosystem is new. And I, if you take it back and you go, what is the insurance market? It is one massive ecosystem. That is what we do. And as the insurance market, we're just so good at slicing and dicing risk and layering it and, you know, and, and distributing the risk. And so, and, and the way Lloyd's, and, and you know, it's not just Lloyd's, it's all of the insurance markets work with the brokers and the insurers and the clients, 
to come up with the correct solution, I think is an ecosystem in its own right. So, you know, when we talk then about, well, where's the technology bit coming into it? I think everything that Lou said, it was really resonated is that we're not trying to replace what we've done before and just make it virtual or make it digital. We're taking the best bits of the current ecosystem and then the best bits of a digital world and the best bits of being data centric and then combining that all together to have a fully functioning and future-proof ecosystem, really. So to me, it's an evolution rather than revolution. I think it's really exciting to be in. And, you know, I think Lou was talking so passionately about um, the insurtechs. And I just think there's, there's so much, or fintech generally, there's so much value that we can harness in the insurance industry from technology if we're actually willing to adopt it. You know, and Julia also mentioned, we have huge opportunities as the insurance industry and our huge disadvantage can sometimes be our history and our heritage and our unwillingness to move forwards. COVID has been really unfortunate, but it is also providing the tipping point for true game-changing adoption of technologies, a new ecosystem, a new way of thinking. So I, I think the, the future for Lloyd's is really, really exciting. There's been some great research done uh, by McKinsey in the last six months, which has looked at how organisations have fast-forwarded in a digital sense during the pandemic and depending on where you are in the world and whether you're looking at back office or front office um, process or customer delivery the world has moved forward by between three and seven years and, and I was a bit naughty when I was talking to somebody in the insurance industry and I said what you've got to be careful of is the insurance industry on average in that context has moved forward by between three and seven weeks and, and one of the dangers is, and it was a serious point to me being a bit naughty, is that um, if you're not careful, the insurance industry will f- fall further and further behind and there will be a lag between what the customer is doing in their business and what the insurance industry can do to keep up and fulfil the needs of that modern business. And that is, um, it is the issue of legacy, which sometimes is a bit like a ball and chain around the ankles of the insurance industry. And I do think Lloyd's has got a big advantage here because they've got a bit less of that ball and chain and they've demonstrated that in some of what they're doing. But but it is a challenge. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, and also tying this all together, Julia, with Roads to Repurposing report, this is like a resetting and or looking at how purpose is so important in the sort of whole ecosystem as it were. Tell us a bit about that. So corporate purpose, um, not a new concept, but it's one that's become much higher up the agenda in the past decade or so. Um, And certainly since the 2008 recession, there's been a growing sense, I think, among executive teams that they ought to be able to share very clearly why their business exists and what the role of that business within the larger society should be. And at the same time, corporate and business responsibility and sustainability have become mainstream as boardroom issues. So what we're trying to do at Ernic is that we're building on some work that we did in 2018 called Roads to Revolution, which was looking at the pillars of resilience in organizations. uh, And there were five of those. And uh, I, I will avoid the lecture and go through all five. But what we said is in the digital age, are they the same? And the answer we came up with is yes, they are the same, but actually there are three more that you need um, to consider. And the three more that you need to consider in the digital age are process and making sure that you use technology to its full effect, keeping engaged with your stakeholders, and the third purpose. And I actually think what our colleagues from Lloyd's have been saying is the epitome of all three of those principles. Uh, a lot of the blueprint at Lloyd's is importantly looking at process, but not only at process. They have engaged their stakeholders, including people like our members at Airnick. And I think uh, a lot of what has been described in that blueprint is actually another name for Lloyd's repurposing itself, because what they're doing is re-looking at why they exist and re-looking at the things they should focus on to deliver what it is really that they stand for. And there's a really important link, not only to Lloyd's on the fact that Lloyd's are also as an organization repurposing, but also some of the work that uh, Rachel has referred to on the whole subject of reputation. 
because if you say you're going to do something in your annual report and you hold yourself up to say we are x and this means y and then you don't do it it is a massive potential hit to your reputation if you hold yourself up and you don't actually do what you say you're going to do because every activist every shareholder um, every customer will be looking at you to say well are you actually living what you say you believe in uh, is this actually what you are and i think the important sort of double back to lloyds is they are actually living what they say they're going to do they are actually doing what they say they're going to be doing and therefore for us this is an important issue and part of this report is we're not only looking at plc uk but we're actually also taking a snapshot look at the insurance industry so maybe rachel and lou we should come and talk to you about lloyds being a case study as part of the look at the insurance industry because i think you'd be a very good one but that's what we're doing steve that's why mm. we're doing it um and it's very interesting. I couldn't imagine, you know, even five years ago, someone like Ernick doing a piece of research like Roads to Repurposing. It just shows how the risk profession has become much more a strategic enabler as a function or as a profession of individuals in business, rather than maybe somebody simply, but importantly, being the person who buys the insurance program. It really witnesses a bit of an elevation of the profession in the last five to 10 years as well. That sounded a bit of a platform preach, didn't it really? But it was meant to be. Very good, very good, Julia. But uh, yeah, I mean, sort of wrapping up now, the time's ticking. We've discussed quite a lot. We've talked about pivoting, adapting with this sort of new environment we're living in, our Lloyd's facilitating with its virtual room. We've talked about sort of this new landscape and working with an ecosystem, uh, whether they're sort of insure techs or sort of startups or mature players and um, how innovation is so important in developing new products to deal with things like reputation and tangibles that Julia mentioned and Rachel were talking about as well. Um, so yeah, I think we've covered quite a lot of ground. And so I was see if there's any sort of additional insights that you want to share maybe start with Lou key for me is get involved we want more and more people to be involved we have an opportunity for you to sign up you can be as involved or as little as not depending on pull on time so you can be involved in just providing a view or you can be involved in real user testing or idea generating and we'll constantly talk about what we're learning as we go some things will work some things won't but the key thing is is how do we create that learning environment so as i said we've published all of that now it's open research so and um, we keep asking people as much as you can get involved we had 400 individuals sign up within less than 24 hours when we launched the research site so you can see the passion that people want to be involved in actually reshaping what we do i think rachel made a really important point um London and not just Lloyd's but the London insurance market is a ready-made ecosystem which a lot of industries would kill for and actually that connectedness is critical we need to make that easy for new people entering the industry and um, particularly as we work digitally and physically so how can they build their networks easy so I think there's a lot we can do there to support new people entering the industry so I think that's one area that I think we've got a lot to do on um, but there's such a great platform to leverage from. And then as we really drive that diverse thinking and the teams mirror the market participants they're serving, which you can see that now further afield is, I just think it's a real exciting time for um, positioning the market in its broadest sense for uh, the future, actually. I think, you know, and, and I know a lot of times we say that stuff, but I think this is really the time i think julia and rachel have also talked about that so i think if you want to be involved we're recruiting so i keep putting it out there so uh, if you if you want to be involved in something that's unique and probably once in a lifetime we're really up for listening and we want as diverse teams and skill sets as we can get in right now so please do reach out i will respond as everybody knows i do sit for hours responding to everybody so please do reach out so, Rachel? I think the, the, the key message for me is, you know, the, everything that Lloyd's is doing is really exciting and bringing, you know, insurance into the digital age and into the future. That doesn't stand alone. It needs products to go with it. 
And I think we're seeing the changing landscape of what needs to be insured. And the only way that that's successful, in my view, is by working with the clients very closely to find out exactly what risks they're facing that they really want insured so we can develop. Because I don't think we will survive as an insurance industry doing what we've always done when the clients that we have fundamentally changed the way that their balance sheets are made up and the risks that they're facing. Julia? Um, thanks. I'm, I'm going to bottle what uh, Rachel and Lou said because I thought their words were absolutely perfect. I mean, Ernix, sometimes we can look like we are on a bit of a platform saying what we don't like about the industry and what could be done better. But I, I want to make my final comments along the lines of we are immensely proud to be part of one of the, uh, if not the best in ecosystem for financial services in the world in London. Uh, and I thought Lou's comments about the London ecosystem were absolutely spot on in terms of the foundation that that gives us and the opportunity that that presents and Rachel's comment about being innovative in converting those opportunities. So I actually think Rachel and Lou um, said it all and uh, I completely agree with their comments, but we're very proud to be part of the industry. So when we make comments, it's because we care, not because we don't care. Excellent. Excellent. So yeah, thanks very much everybody for taking part. Hope you found value in this. Yeah, I hope to do this again sometime. What do you think? Yeah. Thank you so much for the opportunity. No, thank you. Good yeah, to thanks, see you, Steve. Steve. No really worries. lovely to meet you, Julia and Rachel. Take care. Yeah. All the best. Bye bye. Bye guys. Take care. Take care. Take care.